That's probably enough to get a thumbnail sketch, pen in hand, and let's do the straightforward parts first. We're going to end up with a graph. That's where we're going. Okay? So that's why getting the derivatives first will tell us an enormous amount about the graph. The first derivative, these are really easy. You can read this off for me, right? What happens to the, um, yeah? It's one minus z. Okay. Very good. We know what happens to the x, just like a regular power comes down, etc. E to the x just stays completely unfazed as the differentiation happens around it. Differentiate one more time. And of course, what happens to the 1? It gets differentiated away, and you just get left with this guy. Okay? So far, so good. Okay? Now, we want to have a look at the next part, which says, deduce that the curve is concave down for all values of x. Hmm. Concavity tells us about which derivative? Okay, it's this one here. And you can see the argument they're making, right? So for part b, I would say e to the x is greater than 0 for all real values of x. Okay. By the way, um, as the extension students will know, it's actually critically, critically important that we say things like real values of x. There are actually values of x that can make this not positive, but we'll talk about that another time. So, Everywhere that we're interested on the Cartesian plane, e to the x is above the axis. You guys know exactly what it looks like, right? So since that is the case, negative e to the x will have the opposite sign. Yes? Like I've just drawn this conclusion straight from this. I've flipped the direction. And that, of course, is what I've already determined for the second derivative. So in other words, concave down for this domain, which I've already stated, all with values of x. Okay? Yeah. What words would you use? Like, double dash of x is always negative, always concave down. There's nothing instrumentally different between what I've said and what you said. However, I would like something like this. I would particularly like some kind of reference to what the actual second derivative is, because. Like, suppose I don't know anything about the exponential graph, right? Suppose I actually did not know this fact. I could kind of conclude this just by reading the question, like, and not actually demonstrating, yeah, yeah, I know that this is the case because it's a particular kind of function. So I, I think this is probably superior. Might even be a bit quicker. Uh, but we're making an argument for a particular function, so I think it's important. Okay, what does part C ask? We're looking for a maximum. Which derivative is that about? First derivative, very good. Because the first derivative will tell us potential turning points, right? Tell us where the stationary points are, and we can work out what kind of stationary points are. So therefore, I will say potential turning points. Because remember, what I'm about to say doesn't guarantee a turning point. It guarantees a stationary point, but not a turning point. When the first derivative is 0. I already know what the first derivative is, so I'm just tidying things up. E to the x equals 1, so x takes on what value? Zero. It's just 0, yeah? Have I answered the question? No. I have not answered the question. I found out what value of x might give me an actual maximum, but I don't really know, right? So I should test, I should test. It's pretty easy, isn't it? Yes? Uh, because we've already Yes, exactly. So you can see it's always concave down, right? Everywhere along the graph. I just found a stationary point. It must fit into this scheme. The only kind of stationary point that's concave down is a maximum, right? So I would just say since part A, right? Uh, B, maybe part Since Right? Since that's already the case and it's concave down, um, x equals 0 is a maximum, or it's where a maximum occurs. Now all I need is, well, what's the actual value? What is the value? It's negative 1, isn't it? So it's 0 take away e to the 0, which is negative 1. y equals 1 is the maximum value. Now, fun part. Sorry? Oh, uh, yeah, of course it is. Uh, we get to graph now. We get to graph. Now, you already know a fair bit about this, yeah? x minus e to the x, you know it's concave down everywhere. 
you know the highest value that it takes, go ahead, draw your set of axes. You're only going to need the negative half of the Cartesian plane because of what I just established. I'll let you have a second to draw it out, see what you can know before I give you a picture. Okay. Let's have a look what we know about this thing. <laughs> it's kind of funny. You, um, you draw your graph. Um, you know that this is the highest you can possibly go, and it's concave down. So you pop your intercept on there. You know it's a turning point. So I've drawn my horizontal line in there, so that when I draw this graph, um, I make sure that I hit the horizontal at that point, because that's what the tangent should do. And then you pause <laughs> and think, well, what else do I know about this? Okay? Now, I'm actually going to show you this a couple of times, because there's lots of information you know that's just hidden in plain sight. Okay? Um, clearly something's going on with the gradient. Something's going on with the gradient. And this, this will tell me what's going on. I just need to figure out what's happening to the left and what's happening to the right. Okay? So for instance, if I take the limit as x approaches, well, let's have a look at the um, left hand side of the graph. That's negative infinity. Okay? As x approaches negative infinity, nothing happens here. What happens here? Negative infinity. Really? If I, yeah, if I put in some large number, large negative number to substitute for that, because you can't, infinity is not a number, so I can't actually substitute it in. If I put in e to the power of negative 1,000, right, the negative actually means it's on the denominator. That is an astronomically small number. It doesn't make sense to me. A microscopically small number, okay? So therefore, the limit of the first derivative for this part is zero, which leaves you just with a one. Right? So that means to the left hand side of this graph, I am approaching a gradient of 1. That's just our regular sort of straight line business. Okay? So this is the kind of thing that's happening. It is not curving downwards at ever increasing steepness. That's not what it's doing. This is where it's going. It's approaching a constant of some kind. Okay? Well, that kind. I put it in to write down. You can probably see what's happening the other way when I put in very, very large values for x, right? What's go again, nothing happens here. What happens to this guy? He gets huge and he's negative, right? So that's why it drops off like a rock. So you can see I've got the steepness happening over here. You've almost got kind of like the weird marriage between a straight line and an exponential, which you know what? Shouldn't be that surprising, because that's exactly what we have combined. Okay? Now, this I'm expecting is what most of you have. No, that's not too bad. I should to be neat, I should put a point for scale in there. What would be a good point for scale? How about one? If I put in x equals one, uh, well I've got to be careful about this. If I put in x equals one, I'm gonna get one minus e to the one. Yeah? That's one minus two point seven one blah 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 blah. So that is minus 1.7, blah, 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 right? Now the reason why I go to the end of calculating that is because I know where negative 1 is. So this point for scale I'm about to put on, it had better be to scale. That's the whole point of point for scale, right? So if that's where negative 1 is, because I've locked that in, um, that would make negative 2 about there. So negative 1.7, I guess, would be ooh, thereabouts. Are you happy with that? So I'm going to call that 1, 1 minus e. Those are the coordinates, okay? That's good, that's important. There is still one more thing missing though. Hmm. Any takers? There is an asymptote, okay? Now I already had the intuition to know there would be an asymptote here, because this is what the gradient is doing, it's approaching a straight line. But, I want to call your mind back to the end of last year. Do you remember, um, extension one students, I was very cruel to you and I made you come to some extension two lessons, because I said, I'm gonna teach you a method of graphing particular kinds of functions that you didn't, at that stage, you didn't have the calculus to deal with in this way, but there's nothing stopping you getting a general picture. That's a composite function, right? It's a composite function. It's made up of y equals x, and I'm going to do it by addition of ordinates. So I choose to think of this as x plus negative e to the x. Is that okay? So that's been flipped vertically. Flipped vertically. So here he is. Here's that upside down exponential curve. And now you can see very clearly what's going on, right? Look at this. Um, let me do it just by addition of ordinates, because we all did this last year. What's the easiest point to add on here? Zero. It's the zero and the negative one. Bam, I knew that, right? I can see over here the exponential curve is vanishing away. We kind of already knew that, right? So being that the exponential curve is vanishing away, all you get left with is this guy. There's our asymptote, right? That's what I'm approaching. 
And then of course over here, well, what would you say? Who wants to stick up their hand and give me some gestures? Okay, so clearly, if it's like a tug of war, exponential is going to win, right? But it's not like this guy disappears, right? So even though this wins, I'm always going to stay just above this graph. So something like that. There about. Are you allowed to do that rather than? Okay, now let, let's think about this. So the short answer to that question, the short answer in this context is no. Uh, and the reason why is, look, look, I've done all this stuff. Like I was, I was forced to go through, jump all, through all these hoops. I had to do the derivatives. Like the argument I just made with all these green lines had nothing to do with calculus. And notice, I didn't really know that there was a stationary point there. I just kind of guessed. Right? Whereas by going through this process, it's like, yeah, I know there's a station point. I know exactly where it is and what its value is. Okay. Calculus has to tell you that. However, like what I would do, like the reason I knew to say all these things and ask you those questions is because I already had a rough sketch in my brain that that's what it was going to do. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a little bit like at the moment, I'm teaching, um, I'm teaching Year 7 how to round and estimate. So I, I teach them stuff like this. Right? They can work this out, they can go through the long steps and get an exact answer. But then at the end I say, okay, now can you just check that? Like, let's just round these numbers. Let's go towards something round. Can you, like, double check it against, uh, that's going to be, just try that, right? Now that's really easy to do. E every single year seven student can do it at the drop of a hat. And they can know, yeah, good, I'm in the right ballpark. I didn't accidentally add a zero, or my answer is twice the size, or that kind of thing. And that's kind of how this functions for me. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's exactly what I expect. This is exactly what I expect. The calculus sort of confirms what I was predicting. 